All right, welcome back. So today is our third and final lecture on uh, numerical differentiation and numerical integration. So we've already talked about uh, taking the derivative of data, and now we're going to look more at numerical integration. Okay, so this is the board that we left on uh, at the last lecture, and basically what we did was we defined some function at discrete points uh, in space, discrete x points, and we said that the right-sided rectangle rule, the integral from a to b of f of x, is going to exactly equal uh, the limit as delta x goes to 0 of the sum from k equals 1 to n of my function evaluated at x of k times delta x. Uh, similarly, I have a left-sided rule where instead of defining the rectangle height using the rightmost point of the interval, I can define it using the leftmost point of the interval. And now my sum goes from k equals 0 to n minus 1 instead of k equals 1 to n. Okay, so of course for um, numerical integration, we're not going to take the limit as x goes to 0. We're just going to pick a small delta x and use these formulas. <coughs> okay, so perhaps we should just code this up in MATLAB to get a feeling for what this looks like. And then there's two more things I'm going to do. I'm going to prove to you or demonstrate to you what the error uh, accuracy of this method is. And I'm going to introduce a couple more uh, more accurate integration schemes called trapezoidal and Simpson's rule. Okay, but for now, let's go to some MATLAB code. Okay, good. Um, all right, so we're going to demonstrate a numerical integration scheme on our trusty sign data. Okay, so I'm going to clear all. I'm going to say my interval is from a equals 0 to b equals 10. And I'm going to, um, and I'm going to um, have a time step of 0.01. So there, okay, what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to have, I'm going to define my data on a really fine grid so that you can actually see what the function looks like. And then I'm only going to sample it on a coarser grid, and that's going to be the data that we have to work with. So I'm going to call this my fine dx, and my fine x is equal to a to dxf to b. So from a to b in increments of dxf. yf is my function. This is going to be sine of xf. And I'll just plot uh, xf and yf so you can see. Okay, I probably want to call this uh, numerical int d. Uh, I should close all my plots. Okay, so this is the kind of high resolution uh, thing that I'm working with. It's got a lot of data points, okay? <coughs> Okay, now I'm also going to define this course grid that we're going to actually do the numerical integration over. So I'm going to say dx course equals 0.5, xc equals a to dxc to b, so from a to b in increments of dx course, uh, y course equals sine of x course, I'm going to hold on, and then I'm going to use something called the stairs plot so you can kind of see uh, what this looks like. Let's make the first plot black. OK, so the black curve is kind of this high resolution representation of this function sine of x. Um, and the red curve is kind of how, you know, this is where our data points actually lie. And I'm using stairs just to graphically illustrate that we're using this kind of rectangle rule approximation. OK. So now, um, again, we're just going to consider this data at this point. So we're going to say n equals the length of my course vector. This is kind of, I always think my boss emails me a, a vector of data, and he wants me to do something to it. So here, I'm going to integrate this uh, course data using the left rectangle rule. So this is area 1 equals 0 for i equals 1 to n minus 1, my area is equal to my area plus the area of one of these vertical rectangles. <coughs> so 
So I'm accumulating, I'm adding up all of these rectangles starting with zero. Okay, so my y course evaluated at i times dx course. Okay, and this is a left rectangle because I'm integrating from my first starting index, which is one, okay? Uh, on the board, we did zero to n minus one. Um, MATLAB indices always start with one, and so we're gonna go uh, from one. Okay, good. Um, and then I'm going to do the right rectangle rule. Similarly, area two equals zero. And for i equals, now we're gonna do i equals um, still one to n minus one. Area two equals area two plus my data evaluated at i plus one. So now this is the right hand side of that rectangle times dx c. Okay, and I just wanna plot, uh, or not plot, just print to the screen area one and area two. Okay, so my first estimate of the area is 1.9366. That's my left hand, uh, my left rectangle rule. And my right rectangle rule thinks it's 1.6646, okay? And this is just because I didn't choose a symmetric region. So there's some kind of more positive slopes than negative slopes or maybe vice versa. And these methods always systematically over or under predict um, certain slopes. And if I make my dx course smaller, like 0.1, they should agree more closely, hopefully. Right, so now my two estimates are getting closer to 1.8 with these approximations. <coughs> okay, good. Um, we could actually figure out what the true area is um, by looking at our, core, our fine grid, or we could actually integrate this kind of analytically, but we're not gonna do that yet. Okay, great. Um, so that was just, I just showed you how to do left and right-handed integrals in MATLAB. Um, now we're going to look at the error properties of this integration scheme, and we're also going to derive a better integration scheme. So let's start with, um, Okay, so let's go back to the board. And we're going to be looking at our left-sided integral. So we're gonna say our integral from, let me label this, we're talking about error analysis now. Okay, so what we have is the integral from A to B of f of x dx is approximately equal to some k equals zero to n minus one, f of x k delta x. Okay, this is my left sided. But what we'd really like to know is what is the error, like this is not equal to, it's approximately equal to you know this and then plus some error. And I wanna know is that error scale like delta x cubed or delta x or what is the scale like? <coughs> Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to look at one little dx box. Okay, so we're gonna look at a box um, integral from x naught to x naught plus delta x of f of x dx. Okay, and you could replace this with k. This could be the kth rectangle, I don't care. I just wanna look at, um, why don't I do that? That'll make more sense. So this will be, kind of a generic rectangle from index k to k plus one. Okay, so the first thing I can do, uh, I'm really taking the derivative, I'm sorry, the integral with respect to x, and so I'd like to tailor expand this function at the base point xk. So this is equal to my integral uh, xk to xk plus delta x of this big expression, which is gonna be the Taylor expansion of f of x about the base point xk. Okay, so this is f of, I think I can do this cold. So this is f of xk plus x minus xk, right? This is my difference from the base point. 
uh, times d f d x evaluated at x k uh, plus x minus x k squared over two factorial uh, d squared f d x squared evaluated at x k plus let's hope I don't need more terms than that good plus dot 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 dx okay so this is just the Taylor expansion maybe I should write this um, this is just the Taylor expansion of um, f of x about xk Okay, pretty straightforward. And now, did, as far as this uh, integral with respect to dx is concerned, this is a constant, this is a constant, and this is a constant, and x is the only thing that I need to consider kind of an active variable. Okay, uh, so how do I do this? I mean, this is just integrating with respect to x, a bunch of polynomials in x. So this should equal this constant, f of xk, times x plus now I integrate this term with respect to x and I get um, x minus xk squared over 2 times this constant df dx at xk plus uh, I guess this guy cubed over 3 factorial and so on and so forth. And this is times d squared f dx squared xk uh, plus dot, dot, dot. And we evaluate this expression at the lower and upper bounds of our integral. So this is evaluated at xk to xk plus 1. OK, and this is uh, not so bad. When I plug in xk into all of this, and then I subtract, plug in xk, Sorry, plug in xk plus 1 to all of this, and then subtract from it what I get when I plug xk into all of this. And this gives me, um, well, it's going to be this constant times xk plus 1 minus the same constant times xk. So it's going to be f of xk delta x plus, you can work out this math, this is going to be delta x squared over 2 factorial times my constant df dx at xk plus dot dot dot. I don't need to keep track of this term here. Okay, so this is what we get, um, like let's just recap what we've done. We're approximating our integral using this finite sum with a finite delta x. And we're trying to figure out how much error is introduced at each step, um, basically because we're not actually taking the exact integral of f in this area. Um, so we tailor expand f about the data point xk, and this is what we get. Right? And this is the only term we're actually keeping track of. This is our uh, kind of left sided, this is our left sided integral. And this is our error. This is the error, which is order delta x squared. OK? <coughs> Excuse me. So you can convince yourself uh, that right-sided integration is basically exactly the same error, order delta x squared. But that's only for every little dx. Every time I add one of these rectangles, I'm adding another little order delta x squared. OK, so if we go back to this right board, yeah, good. We see um, these little green regions that are being missed by our rectangle. These errors scale like order delta x squared. Okay, so this um, error scales like order delta x squared. But we're adding up a bunch of those errors. Okay, so the error for one little rectangle is order delta x squared, but I'm adding up n rectangles, OK? So n rectangles, um, n equals b minus a divided by delta x, right? 
So I'm adding up a large number of rectangles each with this error. So when I multiply them, I have n times delta x squared equals b minus a times delta x is order uh, delta x total. So this is the total error. And this is the local error. So what that's saying is that, sorry, this is not the local error. Delta, delta x squared is the local error. Every rectangle, I have a delta x squared error. But because I have a large number of rectangles I'm adding up, the total error from integrating a to b is order delta x. OK, that's the, the kind of main uh, mathematical point I want you to take away, is that the little local rectangles are order delta x squared for left and right sided integrals. But the total integration from a to b is order delta x accurate. So if I cut my delta x by a factor of 10, my integration only gets 10 times better. OK? Good. Uh, let's see what else we have. So I feel pretty good about that error analysis. I think now we kind of see the big picture of um, how Taylor series and errors carry over to numerical integration. You can do this for any scheme you like. Um, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about a better numerical integration scheme. So this is left and right sided integral. We have these systematic um, errors here. Right off the top of your head, what's, what would be kind of a better geometric object to add up instead of rectangles? So I'm sure most of you have actually seen this, so maybe it's a little bit um, silly for me to ask. But what I expect most of you are saying right now is that I should be adding up these little triangles. OK, so instead of just adding a rectangle, I should add a rectangle and a triangle. And here there's a very shallow triangle. Um, OK, so basically, instead of just the rectangle, we want a rectangle and a triangle. This is not the right triangle. It's actually this guy right there. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, it's this triangle. OK, so we want to add the rectangle and the triangle. And we do a much better job, and we get rid of most of this error. There's still a teeny, teeny little bit of error here. We'll talk about that in a minute. And this is called the method of trapezoidal integration. OK, so we're going to uh, kind of write up the trapezoidal integration scheme. OK, so I'm going to look at my same function. Um, this is called trapezoidal. Trapezoid rule, if you like. So I have my function, um, and it's defined on some data points, x0, x1, x2, dot, dot, dot. OK, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use both the left point and the right point and figure out the area of the triangle in between. So this is my object now. So we're going to be adding up rectangle and triangle, rectangle and triangle, rectangle and triangle. Okay. So the trapezoid rule says here we have the integral from a to b of f of x dx is approximately equal to the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1. Right. So I'm kind of naming each of these rectangles by the left point, right? 0 to n minus 1. And now I'm going to add up the rectangle and the triangle. OK, so that is given by, how do I want to say this? Um, 1 half fxk, the left point, plus fxk plus 1, which is the right point, times delta x. OK, so this is the trapezoidal uh, integration formula. I take the left point plus the 
f at the left point plus f at the right point, divide by 2 times delta x. Now, I'm going to show you kind of geometrically where you get this 1 half and why it looks like this, because this doesn't exactly look like I'm adding rectangle plus triangle, but I am. So let's think about this. I have, um, let's say I have my rectangle and my triangle. And this is xk, xk plus 1. Um, this is f of xk and f of xk plus 1. So what I'm really doing is I'm adding up uh, this rectangle plus this triangle. <coughs> okay, if I take um, this times dx, it's this rectangle. And if I take this times dx, it's, uh, let's see if I can draw this. So forget about the one half for a minute. Let's just say I look at fxk times delta x. That's uh, this rectangle here. And now fxk plus 1 times delta x is this rectangle here. And when I add them up, I get two of the inside, the lower rectangles, and one of the upper rectangles. So if I divide it by 2, I get one of the lower rectangles and a half of the upper rectangle. So this is one half of you know, the left rectangle plus the right rectangle. That's exactly what this is. OK, and in MATLAB, you can uh, use this command called trap z. So area uh, equals trap z of my x and y data. Okay, and, um, and you get a nice uh, area using this trapezoidal integration rule. So this turns out to be more accurate uh, than the left and right integral rules. If I recall, it's globally delta x squared, um, but don't hold me to that. I think you should just check um, for yourselves. But I know for a fact that this is more accurate than the left and right integral rules. Um, and of course, because you're really not systematically under or over predicting nearly as bad. You're getting a lot of this missing uh, error here. Now, one area where it's actually still pretty bad is in regions of very high curvature. So let's say I look at kind of an exaggerated plot of f versus x. So maybe I have something like this. And let's say that my, da my data points straddle this peak here, this kind of high curvature peak. So the trapezoidal integration is not actually going to do much here. Maybe there's like a little triangle. And we still have a significant error, um, error here, even using the trapezoidal method. So how do I characterize regions like this versus really nice, well-behaved regions like this. Any ideas? What's, what's different between these two? Well, this function has very high curvature between these two data points, where the curvature really means the second derivative. This has large second derivative. The slope is changing a lot in this region. So I get especially bad error for the trapezoidal integration when there's high curvature. So high curvature is bad for error. And that high curvature means uh, large f double prime x. So if you did the Taylor expansion, you'd find that you get large error when f double prime is large. Um, <coughs> and that's uh, kind of something you can do if you kind of follow the same procedure from before. OK, good. So that's the trapezoidal integration rule. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Um, OK, so one last thing I want to tell you about um, is how you actually compute this thing. Because what I've written on the board is actually not the best way to compute a trapezoidal integral. OK, so let's go back to the, um, to the right board now. So the formula I wrote for trapezoidal is sum uh, from k equals 0 to n minus 1 
of one half f x k plus f x k plus one times delta x. Okay, I hope you can see this. So, so the naive thing to do would be to write a for loop for k equals zero to n minus one, add up each of these things times delta x. Now, this evaluates f at you know, points x, k, x, k plus one a bunch of times. And maybe evaluating my function is really expensive. Maybe this is not data at all. Maybe I'm running some big simulation to get f of x, k, and it takes minutes to get every single data point. So what if f is expensive? Um, what if getting data f is really expensive? Notice that you know, every single trapezoid, neighboring trapezoid, actually shares a point. They share a rectangle that they have to compute in common. So the really clever thing to do would be to say that this equals delta x over two times the left rectangle, which I only have to compute once, which is f of x zero, plus the right rectangle, which I only have to compute once, this is f of x n, plus two times the sum of the middle rectangles, two times the sum from k equals one to n minus one, f of xk, right? So these are the rectangles that I am going to have to calculate twice using this formula above, but I only have to calculate them once and just multiply them by two, okay? So this actually reduces the number of function evaluations by approximately a half, which is really good if f is expensive. Okay, great. Um, all right, I think we're flying through this material. This is great. Um, I have about 20 minutes left. So in the last 20 minutes, um, we're gonna code this up and I wanna tell you about one more rule that's really nice to know. Okay, so I told you about trapezoidal integration and now I'm gonna tell you about the Simpsons rule. Okay, so this is, uh, Trapezoid, let's say down here, this is the trapezoidal integration. Okay, and now what I'm gonna tell you about is the Simpsons rule. So this is a pretty good integrator. I think it's order delta x squared uh, global error, but Simpsons rule is much, much better. Okay, so Simpson's rule says, um, I'm not gonna derive this, it's kind of uh, a monster to try to derive uh, by hand, at least I'd rather not attempt it right now. So let's say that I know um, three points. I know x0, x1, and x2, and I know my f at each of these points. I know f0, f1, and f2. <coughs> So Simpson's rule states that the integral from x0 to x2 of f of x dx is equal to this formula, um, delta x over three times f0 plus four f1 plus f2. This is the formula we compute minus a very small error, uh, minus delta x to the fifth power over 90 times the fourth derivative uh, at some constant. Okay, so this is my error. So it's a very, very simple formula to compute the area under this thing. It's got tremendously small error. In fact, if my function is simple enough, if it doesn't have a fourth derivative, if the fourth derivative of my function is zero, then this is exactly the area under the curve, exact uh, integration, very cool. Now, something I haven't really um, brought up until this point, but I think it's kind of a very neat property of these numerical integration schemes, 
is that each of the three schemes that I've shown you is essentially what you would get if you exactly integrated uh, an interpolated version of your data. Okay, so in the, tr in the uh, like left rectangle and similarly the right rectangle, you have your function, um, your function here and you just kind of do a nearest neighbor uh, a nearest neighbor interpolation, right? I find the nearest uh, neighbor point and then I look at the area rectangle. Okay, so this is kind of like, this pen is hard to read. This is like um, nearest neighbor. Okay, this is kind of the same as what I would get if I took the nearest neighbor interpolation and integrated it. Uh, the trapezoidal rule is, right, I have a, the, same, the same kind of curve, these three data points, um, but now what I'm doing is I'm actually doing a linear interpolation between these data points, okay? So if I linearly interpolated between these data points, that integral of that function should be exactly the same as my trapezoidal approximation. So this is kind of a linear interpolation. Try this, I mean, try this out. See that, convince yourself that linear interpolation on your data will give you the exact same integral as trapezoidal rule. And of course, if your data really is connected by lines, like if that's the function, if the function is linear, this will be exact. And similarly, Simpson's rule, let's try to write a little better, Simpson's rule, I can't draw the function that's going between it. Maybe um, you know, I have my same data points. Simpson's rule relies on a cubic spline interpolation. Okay, this is a cubic spline. So if you took a cubic spline interpolation, that's why you need three points, because I need three points to get a cubic spline between them. So Simpson's rule gives you exactly what you would get if you filled in the region between these points with a cubic spline interpolation. And that's why the error gets pushed out to the fourth derivative term because your cubic spline captures the first three derivatives perfectly, okay? So this is just a nice connection I think you guys should all be aware of, um, that all of these more sophisticated integration schemes are really what you would get if you took a high order interpolation on your data and exactly analytically integrated it. So if I wanted a higher order accurate scheme, I could make some kind of fancy fifth order spline interpolation and I could get an even more accurate uh, integration, presumably, okay? Um, great, so that's all I wanna say about that. Um, now I think we should jump right into some code and see how these things look. Okay, um, so this is the code that we wrote. Um, to compute the area, right? So I'm just gonna go through this one more time. We have a sine wave. Um, we have a fine grid, just so we can kind of visualize what's happening. We have a coarse grid, <coughs> excuse me, where our data is being uh, computed. And then um, we compute the area using left and right rectangle rules. That's what we've done so far. Now we're going to add to this a computation using the trapezoid rule. Okay, so the third area I want to plot is um, the trapezoid rule. Area three equals four I equals, um, let's see. Um, well, I'm gonna code it the inefficient way and I'm gonna let you figure out how to code it the kind of efficient way that I talked about on the board. So for I equals one to N minus one, we have area three equals area three plus uh, my course dx over two times my course y at i plus my course y at i plus one. The left and the right, the left and the right um, rectangle integration. Okay, good. <coughs> Excuse me. And okay, so what is my third area? 
Okay, so my left rectangle predicts 1.936, my right rectangle predicts 1.66, and my trapezoid predicts 1.8, which is just about in the middle. So that's good, right? It, it should be kind of in the middle because left rectangle and right rectangle systematically over and under predict, but trapezoid is kind of just right in the middle. Um, why don't we actually calculate what the um, what a better approximation is? Let's do. I told you that there's a command called trap z. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So um, so trap z of my data times dx should give me the same area. Let's call this area three MATLAB. Good, so MATLAB's trap Z agrees exactly with ours. So its trap Z actually just adds up the area um, of all of the trapezoids without assuming a DX, and then you have to multiply it by, by DX, okay? Or you could just say um, XC comma YC, and that will also work. So it, it knows what your DX is. Okay, good. Um, we can compute all of these things over again. Um, Instead of using for loops, so vectorizing your operations, not using for loops is a good idea. So let's compute uh, without for loops. Okay, so area one is equal to the sum of all of my y data from, from one to n minus one times my course dx. It's that simple. I'm just literally adding up, you know, y0 plus y, or y1 plus y2 plus y3, da 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 da, all the way up to yn minus one, and I'm multiplying them all by dx, my course dx. Okay, so that's um, way, the way to do it with built-in MATLAB. Area two is the same sum of yc from two to n instead of one to n minus one. Okay, um, area three equals trap z of xc comma yc. Okay, we can also do the same thing with our high resolution data. Let's just get a better estimate with our high resolution data. I'll say this is using my fine grid. Okay, so yf, uh, yf, yf. Okay, and let's see, um, so my using my fine grid, I get a trapezoidal integral of 1.839. So that's kind of the best guess I have right now. Um, for this numerical integration. Let's see if there's a rule called Simpson, uh, Simpson's. Uh, let's look at the documentation. Let's try Simpson quad, that's what it's called. So there's a built-in MATLAB function called quad, which stands for quadrature, and it numerically evaluates the integral using an adaptive Simpson quadrature. That's kind of fancy language, <coughs> okay? Now, this actually requires a function handle um, and instead, of, uh, instead of actually giving it data. So I think if I said like quad of yf, it's gonna complain, or maybe quad of xf, yf, it complains. But what I could do is I could create a function handle. Um, I could say area four equals quad of at x, sine x, so I'm defining a function on the fly using function handles, and what's the notation? From a to b. Okay, so let's say from uh, a to b. Ah, something went wrong. At sine x. Okay, let's write this again. Area for equals quad of some function a comma b. And my function is uh, at x sine of x. Okay, let's try that. Good. All right, so my Simpson's rule says that my integral is 1.8391, which is exactly what I get when I use trapezoid with a really, really small delta x. Okay, so that's all good. Um, that's a sanity check. This is just some code to try all the integrators we've learned. Um, something cool I should show you on the board before I forget. 
Um, so if we go back to the, to the board, <coughs> excuse me, in the left and right, uh, in the left and right rectangle rules, I kind of, um, well, you don't actually need the delta x to be the same between rectangles. I could have, I could have data where the spacing is not uniformly spaced. I could have kind of a small dx, then a big dx, then a small dx. Um, and all of these formulas apply just the same. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. We're using this kind of fixed dx, but there's nothing that requires that fixed dx. Okay. So over the next three lectures, um, we're going to be talking about a different sort of numerical integration. So here we've been talking about numerical integration of data or functions to get the area under the curve. But in the next few lectures, um, in fact, the next six lectures on ordinary differential equations, we're going to be talking about a different kind of numerical integration where now we're actually integrating a particle through a vector field. Okay? So I'm going to start writing over here in a minute. So we're going to be integrating a particle through a vector field, and I'm just going to show you a picture of what that means. Um, so there's a different kind of numerical integration. Um, this is particle in a vector field. So let's call my particle y. OK, I have y. And a vector field is literally just a bunch of vectors on some domain. Okay, so for example, this blackboard is a pretty good uh, representation of a two-dimensional space. And so here I have vectors defined on all points in my two-dimensional space. Um, could look like this. And what I'd like to know is if I have a particle y that's moving around, where does this particle y go? This is kind of y of t. What is y of t given some vector field? And the way we analyze this is through a differential equation. We say the time derivative of y equals some function of t comma y. So my velocity, the velocity of y, depends on where I'm at on y. And maybe this is actually changing in time. So it also depends on time. So this is an ordinary differential equation. This is what we're going to talk about in the next six lectures. It's extremely important, extremely fascinating. Um, and it's kind of a different type of integration than we're used to thinking. We're kind of integrating the position of a particle. OK, um, I'm not going to do any ODEs right now. Um, we'll do more ODEs later. Maybe I'll just show you a couple of cool examples on my computer of particle integration to motivate the next uh, bit of lecture. OK, so if we go back to the computer, I'm going to open up this keynote kind of particle in a vector field keynote file. Um, and I don't want to jump ahead of myself. So this is a lecture I developed uh, specifically for this class where I'm talking about particle integration in a vector field. So let's see if I can get my pointer. Uh, good, I want you to see my pointer here. So this represents a flat plate airfoil, like a flat plate airfoil and flows going from left to right across the screen. And all of these white points <coughs> are actual particles that are going with the flow field. So this is where little particles of dust would go in the flow past this wing. I'm not going to tell you what these red uh, lines are yet. Well, maybe I will. They're called Lyapunov exponents. And they are really important. But they just kind of show me which material stays close and which material leaves. OK. We use uh, this calculation. I use it mostly for fluid flows. I think about if I have a fluid, where will particles go? Um, so fluid flows are satisfied with the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and these are some examples of wings doing funny things in fluid flows. These are on the scale um, of a fruit fly wing. 
okay, I'm just talking about where particles are going. Sometimes it's interesting to integrate particles through a vector field, forward or backward in time, to see where they came from and where they go. Okay, um, I'm not going to talk about the Lyapunov exponent much, um, except to say that when I track the particles, I can make really cool pictures that tell me where particles came from and where they're going to. And it tells me a lot, ab a lot about how the fluid is mixing particles. So in this case, I have a flat plate airfoil that's plunging up and down and up and down in a fluid, in a still fluid. And these red lines show regions where a significant amount of fluid mixing is occurring. Okay, I'm just going to play it again because I like this movie. And the only way for me to get this kind of a sense of where mixing occurs in a fluid is to take a grid of particles and integrate them through my velocity field, through the, the fluid velocity field. Now, this has huge applications. For example, if you are Ford Motor Company or General Motors or Honda, you build combustion engines. And what's really important for a combustion engine is fluid mixing, right? You want your uh, fuel and your oxidizer to be well mixed before you combust for higher efficiency. This is also important uh, to understand how jellyfish and animals swim and fly and eat. So here we follow these particles in the fluid and we see that blue particles get shed away and the green particles get entrained into the underbelly of the jellyfish where it feeds. This is just a great example where engineering uh, meets science. So they've observed the jellyfish for many years. Here they've built a mechanical jellyfish. They've grafted eight pacemakers uh, onto a piece of, of grown rat heart tissue on an octagonal mold. And they're going to put it in a, um, in a fluid and pulse it with electricity. So a fluid with some salt, and then they're going to pulse with electricity. This is a little robo jellyfish, an organic robo jellyfish. Okay. This is also incredibly useful uh, to understand where particles go in velocity fields, for example, to study oil spills, right? We can study the oil spill uh, of the deep horizon using particle trajectories. Um, we can also figure out where in you know, the ocean we want to dump contaminants so that they get well mixed and don't stay trapped in the bay. And interestingly, for a lot of these applications, you might not have very good velocity field measurements. Maybe you have coarse velocity field measurements um, at a very few grid points. And so you actually need really good interpolation schemes to figure out what is the smooth velocity field between your measurements. So I'm just trying to tie together some of the things we've learned so far. Interpolation, uh, we're going to be learning about particle integration through vector fields. <coughs> and these are the kind of beautiful pictures you can get um, if you do this on the large ocean scale. So these are the mixing structures in the ocean over three days. I believe this was in the summer. This calculation was performed by Phil Dutrois, who's um, from South Africa. Okay, so that's all I want to say. Um, the big picture here, just take a step back for a moment. Um, the big picture here is that we have a really good motivation for studying the numerical integration of particles in a vector field. Okay, this is a different type of, of integration than we've looked at before. Now we have some differential equation, y dot equals a function of time and space. And we're gonna think about tracking particles through this vector field. Okay, it's not only applicable to fluid flows, Maybe you want to track uh, an asteroid through the solar system. That's the same equation, okay? There's so many applications of this. It's incredibly interesting and important. Um, and this theory is going to build on the numerical differentiation and integration we learned for data. Okay, so that's all for now, um, and we'll see you next week.